Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Glory be to God. Let's go ahead and bless the name of the Lord. Let's give him glory. Let's give him honor. He is the Lord. Most high. The ancient of days. The King of Kings, the Lord of hosts, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Give him glory, give him honor. Praise his holy name. Praise his holy name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we worship you, my Father. We bless your holy name. Glory be to your name, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we worship. You want to pray one prayer before we proceed? Loud and clear, you are going to say, Father, Please fight my battles for me. Go ahead, talk to the Almighty God. Lord of hosts, please fight my battles for me. There are battles I cannot fight on my own. Please fight my battles for me. Fight my battles for me, Lord. Lord of us. The one who never lost a war. Please fight my battles for me. Fight my battles for me. Thank you, Father. Glory be to your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jehovah, the man of God, your mercy and your
Ghost, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle, the one who has never lost a war, the one who reigns supreme, the one who is the same today, yesterday, today and forever, the King of glory himself. Glory be to your holy name. Please accept our worship in Jesus' name. Thank you for Monday. Thank you for Tuesday. Thank you for yesterday. Thank you for tonight. Thank you in advance for tomorrow. Please accept our worship in Jesus' name. Tonight, Father, fight our battles for us and give us total victory. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Well, let someone shout a big hallelujah. I want you to wave your hand to two or three people and said, good evening, God will fight your battles for you. And then you may please be seated. Some people are clapping for the engineers. The Lord will fight the battles of the engineers for them. While they are sorting things out, let me Welcome you once again to a new wave of glory. I used to introduce to you our guest speakers. But someone told me that I shouldn't do that anymore. Because he said that as none of our speakers who is a guest, they are all members of the family. So shall we just clap for our speakers? Um, they are part and parcel of us, so they are not they are not guests at all. I have the report of the sanitation department, but I'm not going to announce it tonight. I want to give you an opportunity to redeem yourself before tomorrow. And I'm not announcing because the people who came last scored 90%. Uh, The one who came first scored 98%. So, I'll wait till tomorrow before I will announce the best and the last. Tonight, I've been asked to speak to us on more than conquerors. And I need to make a little explanation. You see, anytime there's a major gathering like this, there could be two 
distinct approach or approaches to a topic. Please, some people are still clapping. Help them, engineers. God will help you. And definitely, you can let my choir suffer, not after the glorious presentation they made tonight. How many of you think the choir did very well tonight? So please help them. Thank you, engineers. And talking about engineers, please tomorrow, after the Holy Ghost service, every one of my children who is a sound engineer should please see me in my office. If you are a sound engineer and you are one of my children and I know there are dozens of you, you must report at my office after the Holy Ghost service tomorrow if Jesus tarries. Now, I was talking about two different approaches. <laughs> ah, okay. God, we have mercy. Now, one approach is called an outreach. An outreach is when you are reaching out to people. People who are not yet in the church. Sinners. You want to bring them in. So we, we call such a, such a gathering an outreach. For example, the Congress in December is an outreach. That's why you find that every day, every topic is the kind that people will clap and shout and jump. An outreach. But the second type of gathering is an enrich when you reach inward to those who are already inside. So the convention is an enrich. The convention is supposed to be a gathering where we look at ourselves, where we discuss issues about those of us who are already children of God on our way to heaven, and we want to discuss how to be sure we will finish well and finish strong. The convention is an enrich. Of course, because the Bible says you are to love your neighbor like yourself, we still throw in a little bit of outreach into the convention. Like tomorrow, for instance, Holy Ghost Night, as an outreach. And that's why you find that the crowd on Friday night is always more than the crowd on any other night because it is an outreach. And incidentally, by tomorrow, we will be moving to the new arena, even though 
there is a crowd already there now. But uh, that's where we will go. We'll be ministering from the altar directly. And this place will still be open as usual as the overflow. Incidentally, the Lord has already told me. Well, I, I will have to stop until the engineers do something about the sound for the choir. I can't leave them out. The topic of tonight is too important for them to be left, left out. So when the engineers are ready, they will let me know. Can you hear me now, choir? Is it yes or no? Okay. They said they can hear now. Praise God. Abi, some people are raising their hand. Is it yes or is it no? Uh, okay. <laughs> Incidentally, the Lord has told me the theme for the Congress in December. You want to know it? Ah, don't you think it is too soon? It's good news. The theme is, the siege is over. If you can just make it in December, you can, you can continue to rejoice. Because the theme for this year's Congress in December is, the siege is over. Now, tonight, I want to talk about more than conquerors from the perspective of an enrich, not an outreach. Life is war. From birth till you leave this world is war. <laughs> Even when you are being given birth to it is war. I mean, Genesis 38 verse 27, Genesis 38 verse 27 says that when a woman is in labor, she's traveling. Traveling. After you are born, as a matter of fact, the moment you arrive, on earth, you begin to cry. I mean, because suddenly, as small as you are, you realize the battle has started. I mean, if you are born and you did not cry, the midwife will pick you up hold your head down and begin to slap your back. What are they saying? Hey. <laughs> you don't realize what you have come into. Cry, my friend. 
And the first thing they do, God have mercy on midwives. The first thing they do is they cut off your source of supply. The umbilical cord. That which have been supplying you food while you are in the womb. What do they do? Cut it off. I mean, where you are coming from in the womb, you didn't have to make any effort. Food was just coming. And you know what? The temperature there is controlled. Right temperature all the time inside Mama's womb. But you come in. Welcome to war. And then you begin to grow. And you have to fight all manners of enemies, known and unknown. Matthew chapter 10, verse 36. Matthew 10, verse 36. The Lord Jesus Christ himself said, A man's foes will be there of where? His own household. If God shows you how many relatives wanted you to die, in infancy, it will surprise you. Thank God you survived. <laughs> Let every survivor shout a big hallelujah. <laughs> and when we talk about household enemies, <laughs> It could be your dad. It could be your mom. Oh, you don't believe me? Genesis chapter 27. Read the old chapter. Genesis 27, from verse 1 to the end. A mother plotted against her own son. Papa wanted to give the blessing to Esau. My mom manipulated the matter so that it was Jacob, Jacob who got it. What of Jacob, what about Isaac himself? He said, ah, ah, this is the voice of Jacob. Why didn't he wait? Your enemy can be somebody very close. <laughs> you know, I've always wondered when God said to Abraham, go and sacrifice Isaac to me. And Isaac asked Papa, eh, I can see the wood. I can see the knife. I can see the fire. Where is the lamb? Papa began to quote the Bible. God will provide. Eh? And I'm the provision, eh? God have mercy on Papa. What about in-laws when you marry? Oh, oh. Read 1 Samuel chapter 18 from verse 10 to 11. 1 Samuel 18 from verse 10 to 11. And you, and you see an in-law throwing javelin at his son-in-law. Thank God for God. That's not to talk about principalities and powers, witches and wizards and abalies and what else? Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. Ephesians 6 verse 12 talks about all the people we are wrestling with. War. From day number one. That is if you didn't die in the womb anyway. <laughs> and in this warfare, 
like I must have spoken to you before, there are possibilities. Possibility number one is less than conqueror. And a man is less than a conqueror when God is fighting against the fellow. I mean, like in Jonah chapter 1, from verse 1 to the end, Jonah 1 from verse 1 to the end, God said to Jonah, go to Nineveh. He decided to go to Tashis. God said, fine, I deal with you. Or it could be God just withdrawing his support. Joshua chapter 7, from verse 1 to 12. Joshua 7, 1 to 12. If God is not supporting you, you fail. Oh, and God forbid, maybe God has even for, completely forsaken someone. Judges chapter 16, from verse 18 to the end. Judges 16, 18 to the end. That's the case of Samson. In all these cases, the fellow is less than the conqueror. It's a loser. And then there's category two, that is a conqueror. And you're a conqueror if God is supporting you in the fight. In 1 Samuel 17, from verse 34 to 51, 1 Samuel 17, 34 to 51, David said, a lion came against me, I killed the lion. A bear came, I killed the lion. Goliath, oh, the God that delivered me from the lion and the bear, he will take care of Goliath. And King Saul said, go, and the Lord be with you. The Lord went with him, and he won. In Joshua chapter 10, you can read it from verse 1 to 14. Joshua 10, 1 to 14. God fought with Joshua. And there was victory. I pray for every one of you tonight, my God will be with you. And then there is category three, when you are more than a conqueror. And I've explained that one before. And that's when God is fighting for you. When he will give you victory without you fighting. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, you can read it from verse 1 to 7. Deuteronomy 28 from verse 1 to 7. Almighty God say, if you hearken diligently to my voice, to observe and to do all that I command you, he said the enemies that rise up against you will be smitten before your face. You are not the one who will do the smiting. God said, I will do it. So if they come against you, what will they flee seven ways? In Exodus chapter 14, from verse 1 to 28, Exodus 14 from verse 1 to 28, when Pharaoh with all his hosts came after the children of Israel, the children of Israel didn't have to fight. All that they did was they just move forward after God has opened the Red Sea. My prayer is that God will fight for you. And yeah. that is how to reach. Let us now look at it from the point of view of in reach. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. 
Proverbs 16, verse 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Your biggest enemy is not the devil. It's not your mother-in-law. It's not the witches, not the wizards. No, 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 no. I mean, the, as a child of God, you know yourself. The Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Bible made it clear, you are more than conquerors through him that love you. God loves you. Your number one enemy is yourself. The one who is truly more than conqueror is the one who has conquered himself. The greatest victory you could ever get is victory over yourself. And I'm going to spend some few minutes showing you the truth about this. Let's begin with something called pride. The number one enemy of yourself is yourself. And he shows himself in many ways. One, true pride. Hmm. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 23. Proverbs 23, verse 29. Says, the pride of a man will bring him low. What does that mean? Witches don't have to worry once you are proud. Pride will do the job. <laughs> you know why? Because James chapter 4 verse 6, James 4 verse 6 says, God resists the proud. <laughs> if you are proud, you are fighting against God. How can you ever win when your opponent is God? How? What method are you going to use to defeat God? Oh, thank God, I am not proud. Uh, uh. <laughs> See, the biggest problem about pride is that the proud ones, they don't even know they are proud. They call it other beautiful names, self-respect. Self-confidence. I am just honoring my position. Lord have mercy. You have any position? <laughs> when David was dancing, like a commoner. He was king. 
The wife looked at him and said, what's wrong with you? You are a king, eh? Honor your position, man. How can you be dancing like a common man? David said, <laughs> I'm dancing for the one who made me king. He makes, he cannot make. Promotion comes from him. He raises up word and brings down another. See, when well, it shows. This is an in ritual. If you get angry with me, it means uh, I'm hitting you at the as a soft spot. But at the end of today, you are going to be more than a conqueror. It shows pride. It shows. When it is time to praise God, look at those who do it very well. Children. Because they don't know anything yet. They don't, they don't respect their position. They don't respect anything. This, you are no longer hearing. Oh God, have mercy on you. <laughs> and you need it more than any bonus. Because the way you dance before you became pastor, it's different from the way you dance now. So the engineers will have mercy on the pastors too. I was talking to my children, the pastors. I can't wait. I'm sorry. Get the tape. I said we went to hold the Holy Ghost service in one of the universities. And you should have seen the Vice Chancellor dancing. Dancing more than the students. The students who don't do anything yet. And God looked down from heaven and saw that. So when some weeks later, the enemy rose up to remove him, the Lord of hosts decided, I will remove the enemy. When you humble yourself, God fights your battles for you. Pride shows. Even when we ask you to shout hallelujah, pride shows. Are you hearing now? You are still not hearing. <laughs> hey, there, Joe. Abby. So, some people ask me. How can you be humble? Considering all that God has done for you. And without doubt, God has been very gracious to me.
I mean, one of the topmost magazines in the world said that I'm um, one of the 50 most influential people in the world. God has been good. And you see, hear me say, sir, to my driver. Why? Because God loves me, he talks to me, you know, like we were discussing yesterday. He talks to me intimately. And I, I will remind you of what happened. After Lekki 98, one of the biggest programs we ever held, we came back here at night, I was out. Praising God, thank you for the mighty things you have done. Between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m., I know the spot where I was. I suddenly heard his voice. Son, bend down. Ah, quickly, I bent down. Because this place was jungle then. Maybe a witch was flying past. And he said, draw the figure of a man in the sand. And quickly I drew the figure of a man. Zero for head, lines for body and hands and so on. And he said, this. He said to me, stand up. I stood up. But now I knew this, this is not going to be a small discussion. He said, wipe out what you have drawn with your leg. I did. He said, son, if you ever forget who is the one in charge, I will wipe you out. Nobody will ever remember you came into the world. <laughs> you still want me to be proud after that? You think I'm crazy? You must conquer pride tonight. Do I hear your amen? Let's take something else. You are lost. You're lost after the opposite sex. <laughs> I know there are people who tell you once you are born again, you're a child of God. we have victory. <laughs> I tell you, you can do what you like. Fool around with the opposite sex. It doesn't matter. They say you will make it to heaven. I say, eh? Testament, not old. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. First Corinthians 3, verse 17. Written by the apostle of grace. That you are the temple of the almighty God. And you defile his temple. He will destroy you. He didn't say I will send an angel to do it. He said he would do it himself. So you think adultery, fornication, is something to be toyed with? 
Are you mad? You think you can toy with divine destruction? When God destroys, He does a good job. Because our God is a consuming fire. When fire burns, there is no science yet that can turn ashes back to what it was before fire came. Don't let me spend too much time on that. <laughs> what about food? Eh? Food? Yeah. God wants you to eat just to have enough strength to continue to do the job. Some people have turned food to a God. Philippians chapter 3 verse 19. Philippians 3 verse 19 says, the belly of some people is their God. And he said the end of such people is destruction. Why are you doing this? He said, I must eat. Why are you cutting corners? I must eat. Ah. Food for the belly. Belly for food. Both of them will be destroyed. No, food is not my enemies. Pastor, you got it wrong. Oh. Why do you groan when we announce a fast? How come you don't shout for joy when, when I say you are going to fast? You can hear now. You still can hear. Hey, I said by the truth. You know, in July, we normally fasted at least two weeks in July, if not for the whole month. But this year, I announced to my pastors, the senior pastors, to go and tell the congregation that since we already fasted 63 days at the beginning of the year, all we need to do is top it up with seven days. They were glad. I thought they would say to me, Daddy, only seven days? They beamed with joy. <laughs> I was never a faster before. The first time somebody told me that I was, I was to fast for three days and three nights without food, I called him a murderer. But God gave me victory. He will give you victory. The Lord Jesus himself said, there are certain demons that cannot go out except with prayer and fasting. How did I get my victory? Oh, God helped me. I just, once I decided how many days I'm going to fast, 40 days and 40 nights, I go to the calendar, count the number of days, and mark 
And I tell my belly, after that day, you will get food. The belly will grumble. When you are on a fast, everywhere that there are restaurants that you didn't know before, you will discover. Let you tell the devil you are a liar. From tonight onward, your belly will no longer be your master. Let me talk about another one. Talkativeness. You just want to talk. And yet it is clearly stated, clearly stated. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 13. Proverbs 12, verse 13 says, The wicked is snared by his lips. It is written, Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. Matthew 12, verse 36. Your best friend, the Lord Jesus Christ, said, Every idle word that you speak, you're going to give an account in the day of judgment. What does that mean? The less you talk, the better. Because everything you are saying is being recorded to be used against you on the day of judgment. Don't let me say too much on that. Some of you, you must talk. You must be hard. Why don't you girls keep quiet here? Yeah. I was at the meeting of one, a meeting of some big men of God. And there was one fellow there. And everybody speaking, he must say something. He must, after some time, I said, sir, you think you know more than every one of us? If we just learn to keep quiet, you may learn something. If you let others talk, you might learn something. Let me move on. What about this issue? of something in your life that you know is wrong but you see it's not too bad. Ah, is it on now? Can you hear now? Still no? Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. There are some things you do, and you know it's not good, but you say it is not too bad. I've told some of you before, by the time you say it is not too bad, it means it's already bad. You are just looking for an adjective to qualify bad. Let me just give you two quick examples in the Bible. Two great men who had just one little habit that they just take a cup of wine occasionally. Not too bad. And then when you read Genesis chapter 9, uh, Genesis chapter 9, 
from verse 20 to 25. Genesis 9 from verse 20 to 25. The Bible tells us that Noah had three sons. A great man of God who survived the flood. But you had this little habit of just a little wine occasionally. And one day he just got, took just one cup too many and became drunk. When he woke up, he pronounced a curse on one of the three sons he had. I said, servant of servant, will that fellow be? He cursed his own legacy. Oh, but there is even one that is worse. Genesis 19, from verse 30 to 38. Genesis 19, 30 to 38. That's about Lot rescued from destruction. When he, he too had a little problem of <laughs> just a little wine occasionally. And the two daughters got him drunk, one after the other, and slept with him. And he produced children by his daughter. He produced two families. But if you go through the scriptures, you don't want to hear what God is saying about them. Not too bad. Check it. You must overcome it. If it's not too bad, it's already bad. But, uh, <clears throat> because they say half a word is enough for the wise, because I'm sure by now you, you are beginning to check. Let me just mention one more. And that is anger. I mean, we all know clearly, clearly. Nobody gets angry without a reason. Somebody must have provoked you. But Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 9, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 9, it says, Anger rests in the bosom of fools. And like I taught those of you who had attended the school of disciples, whenever you feel anger welling up, quickly tell yourself, don't be a fool. I may consider such a great man as Moses. Numbers chapter 20 from verse 1 to 12. Numbers 20 from verse 1 to 12. He had been laboring for God for 40 years. Leading the most hey, difficult set of people. And then just before he got to the promised line, he lost his temper. Watch it. Anytime something is trying to make you angry, quickly check. The devil is about to spring an attack. Refuse to be provoked. Refuse to be angry. And I can tell you several, several stories where the Almighty God had delivered me from what would have been catastrophe because He gave me the grace to refuse to be angry. I'll tell you two quick stories and then the rest is up to you tonight. Several years ago, we were going to hold a 
the Congress in Undo. The choir have been practicing. They want to go with me so they can sing at the Congress. A day before departure, somebody convinced my father in the Lord that not all the choir should go. Only half should go. And they ran to me, sir, you are the only one who can speak to your father in the Lord to let all of us go. We have all been practicing. So I went to my father in the Lord. My father in the Lord said, no, decision has been taken. Ah, who did this? And anger began to well up in my, in my heart. And you know, when you feel that kind of anger, you qualify it. You call it righteous indignation. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit spoke to me straight. You dare not be angry. In the name of the one who sent me, I decree to all of you from now, you will never be angry again. So quickly, I cooled and fast. I told the, those poor people who could not trouble me, I said, I'm sorry. There will be other times. And so we went to the place where we were going to have the program. And my cousin, his wife-to-be, and five other people were in a small Volkswagen B2. And at the very gate, of the venue, they had an accident. A bus hit them from behind, pushed them into the mouth of another vehicle, and squashed the car. With several people inside, they all came out alive. When I heard the news, Daddy spoke to me. If you had been angry, the blood of seven people would have been on you. I decree once again, for the rest of your life, you will never be angry again. One more story. The last one for tonight. <laughs> I told you this year's convention is not like the other ones. I just want to remind you, I've told you the story before. There was a man. His only problem was anger. You know, when the Bible said anger rests in the bottom of a fool, He's simply saying, if you are soon angry, you are like a madman. Anger is temporary madness. That's why you hear people say, I was mad with them. And they say it with, uh, with pride. This man had this problem. When he's angry, oh, he can, he can do anything. So he bought a brand new car. Parked it in the front of the house, rejoicing. And his son took something sharp 
I think it's a nail or something. I went and began to scratch on the new car. And this man saw it. Ah, my new car? You this boy? And the first thing he saw was a hammer. And he smashed the hand of the boy. And the boy screamed. By the time he had cooled down a bit, he saw that the fingers of the boy had been smashed. So he rushed the boy to the hospital. And when they got to the hospital, the doctor said, there's nothing we can do. They, have, they amputated the fingers. So the following day, he went to see the boy in the hospital. And the boy said to him, Daddy, when will my fingers grow again? He came back home, heavy. I went to the car. What was it the boy wrote on the car anyway? The boy had written on the car, Daddy, I love you. The man committed suicide. You want to be more than a conqueror? yourself and Jesus can help you so if you are here and you are not here born again come to the only one who can give you victory over yourself Come to him. Let him, first of all, wash away your sins. Let him take care of the sins of the past. Before you now begin to talk to him about total victory over yourself. So if you want to give your life to Jesus, I will count from one to ten. Before I say ten, Please come and stand before the altar. We will call on God together. And He will save your soul. Don't let pride hold you down. If you are not yet saved, you know you are not yet saved. Come. It doesn't matter what anybody may think. If you are concerned about what others may think, that is pride. So come now and let Jesus save your soul. I'm counting one. Two. Three. Four. Five. 
five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Thank you. Keep coming, keep coming. If you are on the way, keep coming. Now, those of you already in front, and those of you already on the way, cry to Jesus Christ tonight. Tell him, Lord, I am serious. I want you to save my soul. I want your blood to wash away my sins. I will serve you. I want to be one of your own children. I mean business, Lord. Please have mercy on me, save my soul. Cry unto him. And the rest of us, let's stretch our hands towards these our brothers and sisters and pray that the one who saved our souls will save their own souls also. Let's cry to God that God will give them a brand new beginning. That God will give them genuine salvation tonight. Let's cry to God for them. Please pray for them. Pray for them. It's a seed for them. Those of you asking God for salvation, talk to him. Please, Lord, save my soul. Have mercy on me. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I will serve you for the rest of my life. Give me a new beginning, O oh Lord. Give me a new beginning. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. My Father, my God, I want to bless your holy name for your word. And I want to thank you for these wonderful children of yours who have come to surrender to you today. Please receive them. Save their souls. Let your blood wash them clean. Write their names in the book of life. Receive them into the family of God. And from now, any time they cry unto you, please answer them by fire. And let them serve you to the very end. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Now I rejoice with those of you who have come forward. I want to assure you that by the grace of God from now on, I'll be praying for you. The counselors will give you some cards that you will fill. 
your names, your address, your prayer requests, and I promise you I'll be praying for you. Now we want you to join us in the next prayer that we're all going to pray. How many of you want uh, to be more than conquerors tonight? Let's stand on our feet. Let me hear you shout a very big hallelujah. Uh, that's not bad. But if you are really happy that I spoke the truth to you tonight, even though the truth might be bitter, let me hear you shout hallelujah. The prayer you are going to pray is similar to the one you prayed at the beginning. These things that you must overcome, you can't do it on your own, except God helps you. Cry unto God and say, Father, fight my battles for me. Give me victory over myself. Go ahead, cry unto the Almighty God. 